Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for being here. I um, for another one of our webinars, uh, you know, with the uh, I am the director of the Maddie's Human Animal Support Services Project, Vincent Medley, and I'm always happy to see all of our people here and being able to be back and ready um, to to hear from a distinguished um, group of guests. Um, I'm going to do a few housekeeping notes before we get started, just so everybody knows. Um, in the Zoom, you will um, see that Q&A button that's down at the bottom um, next to the chat option. So use the Q&A if you want to submit a question. Don't put it in the, in the chat because we're we want to track it and we want to make sure that I am able to read it and make sure you get your question answered. Uh, use the chat for conversation. Please stay on subject. Let's be let's be neutral to positive when we're making comments as well, just so that nobody feels you know we want to we want a safe space for people to be able to share information. Um, but you do that by using the drop that blue drop down button and remember to um, select everyone instead of unless you want to message like uh, the panel directly. But otherwise, we encourage you to use use the everyone button. Also at the end, stay tuned. We're gonna fill out a brief survey. So I'll try to end a couple of minutes early to give you time to do that. And then also um, the re this recording um, will be distributed within three to five business days um, to the email that you registered with. And if you don't see that within the three to five uh, business days, be sure to check your spam or visit humananimalsupportservices.org backslash webinars. Okay, now, um, hey, Kimberly, I just saw your um, saw your note in the chat. Welcome. So now let me start with uh, with introduce our tonight's panel and our subject matter for tonight. Um, it's called Beyond Enforcement: Insights in Community Centered Field Services. We will have the opportunity to speak with a selection of incredible experts. And I'm going to invite our panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Josh. Hello, I am Josh Fisher. I'm the Director of Animal Services for the City of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County here in North Carolina. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. I saw some rec names that I recognize. I know we've got uh, some folks from Guilford County here in North Carolina. I saw Risa from Virginia. Uh, looking forward to talking to everybody tonight. And I guess you wanted a little bit of background, right, Vincent? Yeah, give us a little bit of, you know what, actually, let's do the this intro, quick intro first, and then we'll do the background. Perfect, then I'm and, done. But just so, just so we know, you are a veterinarian, correct, uh, uh, Josh? I am not. I am a PhD, not a DVM. Oh. oh, okay. There we go. So I'm glad I clarified that. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. Next, Scott. Thanks, Vincent. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Scott Giacopo. I am the director of National Shelter Support for Best Friends Animal Society. Right. And then um, how long have you been in that position there, Scott? Uh, I am coming up on my, just finishing up my sixth year here at Best Friends. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been in this business. I don't know, like you had said, you wanted to do the backgrounds in a little bit, but I think I'm the uh, the older of the group here. Um, I've been in this business a mighty long time. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll, we'll compare. We'll compare our two uh, two uh, what do you call it uh, timelines. Sounds and good. Mike, well, I'm Mike Wither. I'm the director for the city of Cabot, Arkansas, Cabot M Sports Services. Um, I'm also on the board of the Arkansas State Animal Control Association and NACA. Dr. Josh Fisher forgot to mention he was the president of NACA, which is kind of important, and Scott, previous president. So I um, thought I'd get that out of the way. Um, but I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me, folks. It's been 14 years. I forgot we have these VIPs on our uh, on, on this panel. My goodness gracious, presidents. And anyway, um, okay, so um, the... Let's start off giving everybody some background because, um, yeah, just just talk to to us a little bit the, um, about number one. You know, you've already told us your position, but how long you've been 
um, in animal welfare and what led you to uh, the enforcement, um, you know, the enforcement side of uh, animal welfare? I can start with, I will start with Mike since he went last. Uh, well, mine is simple. Um, I moved back home so my kids could have a better school system. Didn't need a job. So I had a choice of three. I could sell medical products. I could be a life coach in a women's prison. My wife saw too many movies. She said no. So <laughs> then park a shovel crap in a kennel. So this is what I took. Um, sound like the best of all three. So I took the job and then a few years later, my director decided to steal money from the donations and uh, I applied for the job and now I'm here. And so how long has that been? 2012 is when I took the director job. Wow. Scott? Yeah, like I said, I go way back. Um, I actually... I grew up in a family of police officers and the uh, expectation was that I was going to be one as well. And, and for some reason it just didn't feel right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Didn't feel right at the time. Um, it was the late eighties and I was enrolled. I was about to be enrolled in the Boston police Academy and it just didn't feel right. So I withdrew my uh, application to become a Boston cop and I um, started working at it. Well, I, I moved away. I started working at an animal shelter in Minneapolis, outside of Minneapolis, um, and moved back to Boston and started working at the MSPCA. I felt like I, I found my calling was to work, work with animals. And um, at one point, um, I had made friends with one of our humane law enforcement officers, which in Massachusetts, they're special state police officers. Um, and I, it was a perfect match. It's a perfect fit. So I, I ended up becoming a, a, a Massachusetts Special State Police Officer with the MSPCA. Uh, and ironically, I got assigned to the Boston Police and I started working with the uh, Boston Police Anti-Gang Unit and their Community Policing Unit, which is really where I got a taste of community policing. Um, I remember, funny, I, I actually wrote, I was attending uh, some law enforcement uh, uh, college courses in law enforcement. And I wrote a paper uh, on how to incorporate in, uh, community policing into humane law enforcement. Um, and I never got the chance, <clears throat> excuse me, I never got the chance to do that until I became the chief of animal control for Washington, D.C. in 2007. And that's really where I got to take everything I learned through working with Boston PD and, and, and being that, 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 that type of officer and apply it to uh, actual animal control and humane law enforcement. In, in when I became chief, I, I served as chief of animal control for about ten years, um, right right before coming here to Best Friends. Thank you so much. And what about you, Josh? So I have been in my current position almost nine years here in Charmet, and prior to coming here, I was in a different county in North Carolina, um, and then before that, I was in. Uh, working at the vet school at NC State, uh, corporate veterinary practice, and then a private veterinary practice before that. So I came up through the medical side of things, didn't really get involved in the enforcement side of things until my first shelter. So 12-ish years, I guess, that I've been in the true animal sheltering, animal control, animal welfare side of things um, with some involvement in the field operations side. So at, and at some point you decided to join the Space Force and <laughs> provide services. I did, you know, we've got like alien dogs running around and things like that. So we're just going to address those here <laughs> tonight. <laughs> well, it's good to have all of you. Um, and just so everybody knows, in case you're new to, to our audience, I started in 1999 as an animal control officer in the city of Dallas when... Um, Pretty much the whole shelter was a uh, was was um, was animal control officers and a few other positions like we had like one uh, one vet one vet tech and then a few kennel attendants and um, yeah and I just thought this would be when I saw the posting I was like man that sounds like fun to do a job like that and uh, didn't realize where 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 it would take me but I saw an, I've seen an evolution over the years so let's talk about that let's talk about the evolution, um, the traje trajectory of your careers in terms of 
you know, what was the beginning of your career like compared to what it is now um, and how you how you can how you see that mirrored within the industry um, as we gravitate and move very strongly towards from heavy enforcement to community uh, centric. I'll open up the floor. You know, I, I can speak to that, you know, because as I mentioned earlier, I, I had written a paper back in, I think it was 96, actually, about utilizing community policing in, into humane law enforcement, animal control. And back then, even, even then, you know, community policing, as we know, it has changed, right? And I mean, we, we, we talked about a zero tolerance policy back then, right? And we thought we were doing right. We would go into neighborhoods, we would do sweeps, right? And, and we would, you know, uh, zero tolerance across the board. And, and throughout the years, you know, I, I saw the, I, I had the opportunity to, to see how that really, it wasn't working. Right. And it didn't work. We would sweep the same neighborhood. And, I, and, and I'll be honest with you, part of my job now is I, I talk to shelters who are, you know, agencies that are still operating under that model. Right. Going out and doing sweeps. Right. And, 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 and I realized, like, I, we were doing sweeps of the same neighborhood over and over again. Right. And, right and it, it didn't solve the problems that we were addressing. Right. So that's really for me and, and, and a lot of different things in the industry for me, like what we deeply believe to be true, were challenged and, and, and proven to be false. So that's really for me where I started seeing all of these changes and, and how we can get where we want to be. And I, and I see that now in today's agencies, you know, the agencies that I work with um, that are, are doing real community based work that are out there, um, I see the, the success rate, I see the relationships they build, I see compliance going up, we see all of that stuff. And I look back at, you know, over the 30 years of my career, and I see when I first went out into the streets, you know, a little tough guy with a gun and a badge and handcuffs, right? Um, it, it, it wasn't successful. It didn't achieve the goals. You didn't tuck your boots and your your pants and your boots like I did, did you? <laughs> no, I did not. I did not. Good. I advise against it. Anyway, yes. um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So let me hear from from what about you, Josh? How, how have you seen, uh, or even your organization, your career evolve? Sure. So I can say when I came to Charlotte, we were still under a 50% um, live release rate. We still had over 50% of the animals that we had entering our building, uh, leaving out the back door instead of the front. And a lot of what kind of shifted that for us was that returning pets to their owners in the field. You know, we were bringing a lot of pets in and our facility in particular is very difficult to get to. Uh, we're out on airport property. We're not on any public transit. Um, so, you know, animals came out here and we're tucked down in a corner of the county that that isn't easily accessible. So it was hard to get the for people to come and get their pets. So we were very lucky. We were an ASPCA partnership city. We worked with our Humane Society. Um, Scott and his team have come in and worked with our organization. And we really just kind of started looking at what we were doing wrong, right? We wanted to see where the gaps were and focus on what we could change. We knew there wasn't going to be a lot more money coming our way. So we were looking for things that we could change and change on the cheap. So yeah. one of the big things that we really looked at was stopping these pets from ever coming in and how we could successfully do that. And in order to successfully do that, you have to create relationships in your communities because you have to be able to knock on doors and have those conversations. And I know Scott and I've had this conversation. There is at least one person within a you know three to five street radius of you that knows every single dog that lives yes. within that three to five street radius. Yep. She or he sits on the front porch. Uh, I'm very fortunate. The one in my neighborhood lives right across the street. And she'll tell me if the UPS man stands on my front porch too long. So, you know, she is acutely aware of anything and everything that happens. 
And it's identifying those people, being able to have the conversation with those people, being able to take the uh, animals home to our community members. And ultimately, that's a cost savings for our organizations, which then makes our leadership happy. Um, and or if you're like me, you make sure to spend it on something else so they don't take it away because they will. <laughs> exactly. But it all started with really um, a, a shift in focus. And I think we saw almost a forced shift in that focus when you know 2020 hit and we went into the pandemic. There were so many of us that you know, we, we couldn't bring them in because we didn't have anybody in the building to take care of them. We had folks that were getting exposed and they were out for 10 days and, you know, you didn't have anybody in the building. So you didn't have a choice but to try to keep them the heck out. Right. And that focus, that was more of the shift on the national level, I think. But for us locally, you know, we had started a little bit before that, thank goodness. And it really was uh, shifting from a very punitive approach and you know oh well they let their dog get out they let their you know cat poop in their neighbor's yard whatever it may be um thinking very punitively to meeting people where they were you know starting from a place of understanding and realizing that accidents happen i mean you know we've got people whose babies walk out the front door much less their dogs yeah yeah I mean, it's everything you all are saying resonates so well um, because I remember a large case that I was investigating for animal cruelty when I was like in my second year. And um, the veterinarian said to me, you can't bring, even if they are treating the animals cruel, you still can't bring the animals in here because we don't have any space. And at the same time, those animals were still sick. And we also had a, 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 a person in the community that, that needed support. And so that was the first time I really partnered with a community activist to say, okay, how do we get these animals to a safe place? But what came out of that also was us supporting that person, helping them clean up a, a really pretty bad situation inside their home, helping them get back on their feet, referring them to a social worker. Um, yeah, that was like 2001. And so it was my first entree into that, even though I still was heavy enforcement at that time. Um, it really was my first sight into, man, we could really be making a difference in the community. Um, so, so Mike, speaking of making a difference in the community, talk about your evolution, but also give us a little insight into, I know you have a program called Fences um, for Fido program. And how did you get from wherever you were to being able to administer a program like that in your community? And what effect has it had? Sure. Um, I have the same story. I think probably most of us have pretty much the same story. Uh, I started and it was all all about citations. We have an ordinance. If you, if you don't follow the ordinance, you get a citation. Why? Because you should know better. It's like a speeding ticket. It doesn't matter how long you've been here. You should know what the laws are in the city. So we wrote a lot of citations. I mean, my officers averaged 242 citations each every year. That was their average uh, before 2017. Uh, when I when I took over in 2012, we had an 18 percent compliance rate. So we wrote 242 citations per officer. Um, the funny thing is, it didn't help. It didn't help at all. Uh, last year, we had an 87.3 percent compliance rate without a citation. My officers averaged 16 citations apiece last year. Is all they. So um, that was that's based on two things. Um, 2017, and I'll go through that here in just a second. That was our fences for Fido program was was developed. Um, and we'll talk about that in 2020. Haas pandemic, perfect storm come together basically um, to where we put in 23 programs in one day. Um, our euthanasia rate when I started was around 60 percent. I'm sorry, our live release rate was on 60 percent. Last three years, our live release rate has been over 99 percent, um, and that's because of the community, um, no more punitive community focus um, and providing for the community with what they needed to keep their animals. Um, but in 2017, that's where the punitive approach in, uh, ended. Uh, like all directors, um, if you fire somebody or they quit, in my case, it was usually a firing, um, you have to fill in on the streets, correct? Well, that's what we do. Um, boots on, on the ground, we go out and I, 
I went out. I went out on a call on field crest and two dogs were running loose. They'd gotten out of their fence. I know exactly where they come from. The fence is, is open and they're sitting right there in the front yard. Well, I do what we did. We, uh, I picked them up. I knocked on the door. Nobody answered. I put a door tag on the door and I took them straight back to the shelter because that's what we did. We picked them up, removed them, and right. took them in. Yep. Um, well, Maurice came. Um, Maurice is always going to be engraved in, 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 my, in my heart and in my mind um, because he, him and his family changed my life. They, um, they come up to pick up their dogs like, like all good families do. They couldn't afford the impound fee. So they couldn't pick them up. Well, in our city, you have five days to pick them up. So they couldn't afford the impound fee to pick them up. So what did I do? I wrote them two citations for running at large. I wrote them two citations for not having a city license. I wrote them citations for not having rabies. These citations are $125 to $175 a piece. So around $750 or so in citations is what I did. And I have their dogs and they left because they couldn't have the dogs. The family came, so obviously the, the kids are crying. Um, they have, I told them this, you have five days to come come get them. If not, we're gonna write you another citation. Well, they didn't show up. Uh, they couldn't afford the, the amount to get them out the first time. Five more days of impound fees and daily charges, they couldn't afford that, they never showed up. So I wrote them another citation for failure to reclaim. Um, those were $150 a piece. So we're upwards to a thousand dollars or so now. Um, this is where our system is broken. I was the first part of that break, um, but this is what happens. So they've got thousands, roughly a thousand dollars in citations. They have to go to court or pay the fee. They can pay the fine, but typically they go to court. Maurice didn't show up at court, so when he didn't show up for court. Uh, they put a warrant out for his arrest. They suspended his driver's license on the spot. And then they added another $250 in fines. And once your driver's license is suspended in the state of Arkansas, it's $125 to have it reinstated after you go in front of the judge and start paying your fines. And the judge says, okay. So we're $1,500 or more here. Um, Maurice and them didn't own the house. They rented it. Um, the kicker to this was Maurice was a truck driver. So on top of everything I did to start this off with, he lost his job because he suspended his driver's license. Yeah. So with that, I, I don't know what I've done to, to Maurice and his family. Um, I don't know where they're at. I don't, they moved out of the house. I'm not sure if it was because they couldn't afford the rent, but, or he lost his job. I, I, it's my fault is all I, is all I can say. Um, but I started this whole process because I didn't put the dogs back in the fence. Yeah. I, I could have put the dogs back in the fence. Yeah. I, I could have wired the door, the door shut, put a note on the, on the, on the door and it would have, life would have been fine, but I didn't. So now Maurice, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what kind of life their kids have now. I don't know if they, they hate cities. I don't know if they hate animal control. I don't know if they, they if they'll never set foot in another shelter. Mm -hmm. So what road did I put them on? I don't know. And I, to this day, I still don't know where Maurice is, but that's the day we created the Fences for Friday program. Because wow. I, I don't know. Um, for two dollars worth of material, I could have wired a fence shut. Maurice will probably never be out of the system because if he couldn't afford to pay it then, he may never be able to afford to pay it. And if my system's like y'all's system, which I'm assuming it is, even if Maurice went in and and, and paid, you know, and and got to put on a payment plan, which they usually do, well, say they pay twenty five dollars a month, ten dollars of that goes to the state. So it's worse than credit card debt, 15. And then they miss, they miss a few payments and then they get contempt in court and it's just a vicious cycle. Yep. So I'm not sure 
what kind of life they have. And like I said, it's my fault. And at the end of all this, I've still got the dogs. Not to this day, they've all, they've been adopted, but I still had the dogs. So who benefited from any of that? I didn't, they didn't, and my community didn't. So that was the day when, when I went through that whole outcome, that was the, when we decided no more enforcement. All we want is compliance. And if I can get compliance without enforcement, that's, that's what we do. Goodness, thank you for sharing. And, and you know, while I'm listening to you, I, I, it just, I just started to catalog all the experiences like that I've had in my career, um, either myself or officers I trained and the amount of damage we can do if we don't understand that the system, how, how um, damaging and how strong or heavy the system can come down on a person. Um, so, hmm. wow. Where do we go from here? Let me, okay, so Scott, let me ask you a question in terms of your work with best friends. Um, oh, you know, actually, you know what? I'll come back to that. I wanna, I wanna talk to Josh first. Um, tell us some of the, so, so you moved from, you know, it feels like an enforcement uh, mindset to a community-centric one with your officers. Talk to us about what that process was like for you, like, or, or for your organization. Sure. So I'll be 100% honest with you. I expected the most pushback from the officers that had been doing it the longest. And because, you know, you get that, well, this is how we've always done it mentality, which there are fewer words in the English language that make my eyes twitch as bad as those words in that combination. But it, that wasn't the case. What we've seen over the years, and we still see it, and we still see officers who want to do the same thing that Mike just talked about doing, and that just don't get it. And I think one of the biggest things is creating a culture in which you, you do start from that place of understanding, right? And so for us, that shift was actually easiest starting with our more senior officers who had been out in the community and they had seen this stuff and they already had relationships with members of the community who, you know, even before it was okay, they were doing that. You know, they were putting the dog back in the fence. They were wiring it shut and risking getting in trouble for doing so, right? And so when this shift happened, it was really kind of empowering those officers to share their stories and how that had worked out for them in that case and how that had worked out for that family or for that community moving forward. Um, Cause you know, there are those positive stories as well that, you know, that officers did that or that a, a neighbor helped them out and it's finding those and those positive impacts and letting that help to drive that cultural shift rather than, you know, just putting it in place and saying, do it because I said so, right? Um, we did do some things that that made it so that it was a little bit do it so, do it because I said so. Um, we put some things in place that made it more difficult to bring animals in than it was to find ways to keep them out. Uh, you had to write an extra supplement on what, what you tried and, you know, why you couldn't successfully keep them out in order to bring an animal in, you know, the, the level of paperwork you had to do was more to bring an animal in than it was to get it home. But ultimately the, the change was that, that cultural shift and having the people who are doing it and doing it well share what's working and why. Um, we still do see a lot of individuals uh, come into our agency brand new. We are part of the police department. Um, so they come in and they are gung-ho to slap somebody with a citation and take them to court, boy. Like they're so excited to go to court the first time. Um, I see a couple people in the chat who have either worked with me previously or work with me now. And, you know, they could probably tell you more stories than I could because I think everybody tries to keep those stories out of my office at this point. <laughs> but... 
you know, that's that's still a goal and that's still a cultural thing within our industry that we're having to combat and having to change because we are part of, we, we are in a lot of ways, especially on the animal control side, still considered more of the public safety and law enforcement side of things than we are the community services side of things. You know, Mike's organization is incredible and he's done an incredible job of transitioning that and transforming that and making it truly a community support center. You know, that is, he's transformed how he does it in his community. Um, and I, I would love to see more of that in all of our communities and see more of the, you know, almost social work approach to how we're doing our work, because, you know, there can still be punitive action taken in the social work system, right? We see it all the time, yes. but that's not where they start, right? That's where they, that's where they end up if they can't gain that compliance that Mike was talking about. They don't start there and we shouldn't either. I mean, if it's egregious, you know, yes, all of us have the ability to start there, but by and large, that's not where it should start. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're talking about dog fighting or something that was malicious that, yeah, now we're talking that's criminal behavior, but a lot of our, a lot of, of our enforcement has been, it starts way too, way further um, down the, that road than it needs to. And in fact, it shouldn't start there at all. So Scott, you do you do a lot of work across the country. We heard uh, Josh uh, say that um, you know you even worked with his his team. Talk to us about your work and what you do for Best Friends and how that shapes this conversation. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah, so I have a fantastic team of individuals that are subject matter experts in everything from dispatch to animal control, field operations, field training officers, uh, shelter programming, uh, and and it, even disaster response, right? Which my two team members that focus on that are going crazy these past few days, obviously. Um, but we, we basically, we go around the country and work with agencies that want to, or are interested in making these transitions because all of us have been through it. You know, when I, when I became uh, chief of animal control for Washington, D.C. Um, well, I did go through that transition from a more enforcement punitive based model to more of a community based model. And I, so I've been there. I understand the difficulties um, in, in that agency space for, you know, the director, even even some of the officers. And for me, a lot of it comes down to you know, we talk about meeting the community where they are, right? And I like to look at look at the, the work that I do the same way. I, I want to meet the officers where they are because, you know, I, I don't look at, in most cases, again, there's there's always the exception, but I think in most cases, it's it's just with these these individuals, men and women who 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 had dedicated themselves to to animal control, animal you know, humane law enforcement, whatever, it's what they were taught by someone they respect. Right. And, and, and so to come in there and say, well, you're doing it all wrong. Right. And, and, you know, it's like, that's, that's what I was taught, you know, like my, my, and what I keep reflecting back on when you talk about dog fighting was um, the Michael Vick case, right. Up until that point, I had been involved in so many dog fighting cases where I seized hundreds of, of fighting dogs. Every one of them, I personally advocated to be euthanized because that's what we did. Right? right. That's what we did. And they were dangerous. Yeah. Right. And then and, and thanks to organizations like Best Friends, I mean, you know, the Mike, after the Michael Vick case, we 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 learned we were wrong. Right. And I had the I, I actually had the privilege of meeting one of these dogs from the from the Michael Vick cases. And I and I looked at this dog alive, playing happy. And, and the thought of me advocating for that animal's death was was, was it, it, it was powerful for me. Right was powerful so so I, when i work with officers i i don't want to go in and say you're doing this all wrong right it's it's to me it's the next level right it's 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 showing them a different model a different way of doing it but it's also you know we see so many trends and so many changes in our industry that's brought us to the next level right could you imagine you know in 99 when you started or when i started you know talking about the entire country being no kill by 2025 right with that those words would never yeah. have come out yeah. of our mouths didn't even right? know what that was it, it, exactly you know although I, I remember sitting there saying i wish there was a way we didn't have to do this anymore right yes and now we've found those ways 
right? We found those answers and, and, and taking that approach like Josh, you know, and, and Mike talked about is being out there, making those relationships with the community helps gain compliance. It helps the reputation of animal services in, in the community, but it just, it, and it just helps people. Right. You know, I mean, for me, I remember, you know, I'm not going to go too far down this rabbit hole with the story. It's a lot longer, but I had the opportunity to, to view a kid who was a good kid in a, in a gang ridden neighborhood who had a good dog. Mother wouldn't let it in the house. He had a piece of plywood propped up against a chain link fence. And that was the dog shelter. I couldn't leave the dog like that. So I went down, I just went to a local construction company, uh, a construction site to get some spare wood. I was going to try and help him build something that would bring him into compliance with the law. This kid's like 15 years old, had nothing. And when I told the construction crew why I needed the spare wood, they all came down and built this dog, this fantastic dog house. You know, and for me, it was like, wow, I don't have to, A, I don't have to do this alone, right? I can get compliance and be a nice guy while I'm doing it and feel good about it and involve the community in solving the problem, right? And that's why like Fences for Fido's, love that program. And, you know, when, when I work with agencies, I talk to them about going out to your local fence company and working with them for, you know, having them donate scraps and getting, getting the community involved. And that's really what a community-based approach to animal services is all about. It's not, it's, it, it's no longer us being responsible to solve all the problems. It's everybody in the community whether it's a human service agency, a sign company, a construction company, all of those people can play a role in helping us solve these problems that the community faces with the animals. And that's, that's, that's what we, when we go out to agencies, that's what we teach. That's what we try and not only just give them presentations and workshops, but we actually get in the trucks and ride with them and go out and show them. You know, one of the guys who works with me, Nick Walton, a former officer out of Atlanta, field training officer, so forth. Um, we were in, uh, I believe it was in Florida. Uh, he literally like got in the truck with the manager, went down to a local pet supply store because the manager was like, they're not going to donate anything to us. They don't care about us. We're, we're, we're the dog catchers for crying out loud. And Nick was like, nope, let's go. Got in the truck. And, and by the time they left, they had a truck load, truck load of donations for the community with a promise to keep coming back. Right. So it can happen. And it's just a matter of showing people how to take those steps and what steps to take and actually sometimes holding the hands and doing it. Yeah. No, I appreciate that story. And, you know, what what you said that makes so much sense is that we often think it's an overnight change. The officers, since the idea is such a great idea, let's just you need to embrace this today. But it does take time to meet the officers where they're at. And then also build their confidence and give them a program that they can actually give to the community. So it's, you know, I always say we play with the toys the gods give us. The gods gave me a ticket book when I started and a, and a catch pole and a truck with a hole in the ground that I could actually see the, the road I was driving on if I looked down. So and some people are really uncomfortable changing the way they do their yes. jobs because are they going to be successful, yes. right? Um, are, are they going to still be the same officer? Is it going to work? Are they going to leave an animal in a situation yes. where that animal is going to suffer? Those are all things, especially someone who's been doing this for a few years or many years. It's hard. You know, it, it, it's not like, you know, teaching an old dog new tricks. It's, it's a sense of self. Right. Like when I was an officer, you know, right. you can tell me I was doing things differently. I'm, I'm a successful officer. Right. I've been doing very it good at it. Right. Right. So that's where there's an essence. And, and, you know, one of the things we focus a lot on, too, is change, change leadership, change management um, and helping the director support the officers in not only make the change, but in their struggles to make those changes. Right. And I like that approach because so many former approaches was like, well, you need to fire everybody. And that's not true. I've right. been, I've, I've, I did that. I learned change management the hard way. I, I learned it by doing it the wrong way. I told people effective today, you know, we're going to do this instead of that. Right. And just make it work. And it was wrong. I was wrong. And if anyone is out there watching this tonight that, that, that got caught up in that, I apologize. I really do. I was wrong. I think maybe I should apologize oh, this too, but um, okay. We, we have 10 questions from the audience, uh, from our, from our, um, our, uh, from the audience and I want to get through them um, so let's start at the top um, do do any of you know what work has been done within animal care and control certification programs to include community centered field services I have some I have some suggestions um, 
Well, I, and I'll start. So I know the Humane Society of the United States, their law enforcement training center, which I used to be the program manager for. Uh, they, we developed while I was there a community um, oriented policing for animal welfare sort of, um, uh, you know, um, training that you would could get a certificate for that we would apply for uh, CEs for. Um, and then I will also let the uh, past presidents of NACA talk a little bit about that as well. Um, well, I'll let Josh speak to NACA because he is the current president. Um, but, you know, yeah. best friends, we have we do trainings all over the country. We have a whole Web page on our uh, on our network Web page dedicated to field operations that talks this multiple. There's multiple classes and uh, webinars and playbooks and manuals on everything from field to dispatch to to conflict resolution, all that stuff. So um, it's network.bestfriends.org proven strategies. Um, so I'll let uh, I'll let the the. The, the current members of NACA uh, talk about yes. the great work that they do. Well, and I'll just really quickly say, you know, there's a whole ton of resources and Mike, who is on the professional development committee and helps to build a lot of those, um, can share more about those. But it, there's a plethora. And if there's anything that's missing, please, please, please just tell us that you feel like something is missing because we will find a subject matter expert in it. We potentially even have those of you who are asking for it help us to develop um, so that we can fill that gap. But Mike? Well, NACA, we, we are we are constantly recording new modules um, to our, our animal control class one, one, two, and threes that we're putting together. Um, we've also partnered with Maddie's University and we've done some in-person in classes. Uh, we've also, we also make it a point to do our best to attend every state of so animal State Animal Control Association conference where we're teaching um, and our philosophy is based on the less punitive, more community focused. So we are we are out there um, doing everything we can. And then, of course, we always have the phone calls and the emails and and that sort of thing we answer as well. Great. All right. Thank you. And we are putting links to those to those websites in the chat. Um, just for you all to take a look at, um, but thank you for that. Um, okay, so talk to us about, talk, the next question is from an anonymous um, attendee. How do you incorporate uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging into community-centered field services? And I can start. I can start there. You know, one of the things that is extremely important, especially in our training and our understanding, and this has to do um, culturally, but also in terms of having your team understand the difference between um, between their authority uh, versus their, uh, I, I would say, their background. So, cultural competency is a really big. Um, I think a um, a and training along the lines of cultural competence, competency is a is a ready-made way to incorporate DEI um, because what I found was even cultures that I came from when I became an officer, and you see it all, everyone sees it in the national headlines. You see people that come from a specific culture that are just as punitive in the culture they came from as an officer as um, because the system is baked a certain way. And so having people understand that the system sees and was created in a way that um, that excludes people or at least, well, not actually, it's, the, the system is very inclusive. I, I should scratch that. The question is, is the, how that person or how a certain um, a certain individual is viewed within the system. And so having that understanding of the idea that diversity is all about seeing everyone as, um, you know, treating everyone with, with um, seeing, having the system work for everyone the same. And then the equity is having solutions that fit um, a specific circumstance that a person is in and not treating everyone um, like it's a cookie cutter method. And inclusion is to make sure that those people that are benefit from the system is across the board. And that includes everyone. Um, 
as as a member of the BIPOC community, white people are included in the, the inclusion part of DEI. So um, I just I that the, that portion I can say how how um, how I see it as you know and the belonging piece, which is also what I just said, is that having people have an understanding and a sense that they are part of the solution, which is why community centric a community centric approach is so important if we want to change that uh, change the tide and make make the system more inclusive. Absolutely. I think I would add that, you know, one of the things that we should all strive for is to have our organizations representative of the communities we're serving, right? And if we're not, then why not? You know, where are the gaps there? Where are we missing the opportunities to bring um, the, the members of the community, the community members that we are serving into the fold to help us serve the rest of the community, right? I think that that's something that there there's a gap in. There's a gap in recruitment efforts. There's a gap in, you know, how we're uh, going out and talking to the community about joining the team, essentially, um, rather than just talking about the work we do, but trying to make everyone in the community a part of the work we do, right? And then the other piece there is, and Vincent um, said this at, using the cookie cutter analogy, right? But it's understanding that um, equity and equality are different. You know, we need to be able to tailor um, how we're providing assistance and what we're doing for, you know, community members to the situation that that we're facing, right? Because they're all going to be different. Every single case is going to have different resources available to them, and they're going to be able to make different things work, right? So it's finding out what it's going to take to address each of those situations and help everybody get on the same level, not just treat everybody the same way. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. So how are you calculating, um, especially Mike and Josh, how are you calculating compliance? And also, uh, Scott, you chime in too, but when you, when we use the word compliance, how are you calculating that? You know, I do things simple. So I just take the, the number of citations they wrote and divide it by the number of cases they had for the year. Because if they didn't write a citation, um, successfully completed cases. Uh, we'll always have those that are open or those that we just lost the sight of somebody, but all their successfully completed cases and just divide the number of citations by that. And that's how I come up with the percentage. Well, and you know me, I like to make things a little more complicated than Mike does because, well, that's just who I am. But we are, you know, we're doing similar but we're also taking into account um, cases that are simply unfounded because we do have a lot of things in our community that end up being a um, disagreement between neighbors that has nothing to do with the pet. And so we try to dump those out to the side and not even count those in the calculation. Although, you know, to Mike's point, we might need to because, you know, these officers are going out and uh, doing some um almost uh, mediation type situations where they're bringing each fit neighbor into the driveway and telling them to act like grown folks rather than, you know, children. But for me, it's data, you know, it's looking at the call volume, looking at the types of calls, looking at um, the officer's, you know, dis final disposition, whether that is, you know, uh, no action warranted or um, able to, you know, come bring them into compliance. Um, I'm not a, you know, we, we always talk about compliance in the way of licensing, right, where, you know, you have X amount of people, then you do this calculation to, to determine your population, estimated population of dogs versus how many licenses you sold. I'm, I'm not a big advocate for licensing uh, any longer. I don't believe in it. I think Anyway, I don't want to get on that rabbit hole, but I'm not an advocate for licensing. Um, and for me, you know, when we start looking at call volume, and particularly in the area of stray uh, impounds, right? If our stray intake starts to go down, I know that the officers out there are um, getting animals back home. 
uh, where they belong, which should be a separate category for tracking, right? So we can track the great work that they're doing. And also um, dispatchers and call takers being able to have open, transparent conversations with finders of stray dogs to get them to possibly help find, locate the owner without just saying, well, I'm, I'm just going to bring them in. If your officer won't be here, I, I'm just going to bring them in. I think, you know, in our world now, we rely so heavily on open, transparent conversations, right? Communication. We need that. I think that's a skill that isn't often taught, um, you know, at the front desk and by dispatch, as well as, you know, the officers, but we need to be able to have those conversations and show empathy to the, to the citizens to get them rally to support with us. So anyway, so um, that's where I look at for, for success. You know, when we talk about compliance, we're talking about how do I rate success? It's how I look at, you know, the, the different wording of that question. And that's how I judge um, success. Call volume, you know, call volume can stay up, right? I know they get the, the neighbors and all that, you know, but as long as the 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 animals are not being brought in um, and we don't keep having to go back to the same place over and over again, um, that's success to me. All right. Another question. Um, tell us, give us an idea of how the power dynamic shifts. One sentence, when you have a community centered approach in, in the field. Wow. Um, that's a big sentence. <laughs> you know, they come, they come, they come to your aid. When, when 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 officers are doing what officers do in the field and make sure making sure it's longer than one sentence uh, and making sure that they're focused on the on the customer because that's who who they are their customers uh, the public then you know they know they care and when they care about the public then it's like family the fam the family then comes to your protection so that, that's how it changes uh, budgets go up employee numbers go up new shelters get built Animals Smiles. get saved. Yep. And everybody's happy in the community. Yeah. Well, how do you follow that? I know, right? <laughs> I mean, I think I would just say it it becomes collaborative, right? Yep. I mean, one sentence. Nice. And can you all speak to the importance of allowing officers to have that discretion in the field. How does that, I think those two are sort of married to each other, but yeah, how does that speak to the importance of that? I, I like to say they need to have informed um, discretion, um, not just discretion, um, because discretion is just so subjective, right? I want my officers informed of what each individual situation, right? I want them to know, to be able to pass on information rather than, you know, educating. I don't like educating the public. I like sharing information with the public, right? Yeah. That different yeah. dynamic. Um, and, and so, yeah, I want to make sure that the officers are fully trained and have all the information about what's happening at the shelter, what's happening in the community, any you know, all of that stuff before they make a, a a decision on discretion. So, but these these two here are already they're currently overseeing offices, so I'll let them speak. Exactly what Scott said. You know, it's critical, um, but it's also critical to have all, if not uh, if not all, as many pieces of the puzzle as you can, so that you are are truly making that informed decision. Um, while you're exercising that discretion. And I just don't like the word discretion. I just, it's, 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 it's hard for me to, because really do they have discretion? No, not really. They, they really have to do what's in the best interest of the customer, animal and person. So yes, they have discretion not to, then I have discretion to fire. Um, so they they really just have to do what's best. And if they're always doing what's best for the, the customer and the animal, then life's good all the way around. All right. Well, um, I think we're at, yeah, we're at our time. Man, we still have several questions, but I will send these, we will get these questions out to you and we will get the questions answered for you from the, um, from our panel. So just, I wanna thank the three of you for being here. I'm 
just being able to work with all three of you in different capacities in my career has just been a, such an amazing experience. And I feel like it feels like we need a round two um, because um, such experience and um, people that are actually doing the work. Um, and so um, a few housekeeping notes. Um, so thank you all. Thank you to my panel. And um, let me give you a few housekeeping notes. Um, the um, If you didn't, if we didn't get to your question, um, you can also email us at Haas project at AmericanPetsAlive.org. Um, as a reminder for tonight's webinar regarding um, the, um, we will do, this will be distributed within three to five business days. And then also um, in a moment, you'll get a poll uh, about the webinar. It'll pop up. It should, you should see it right now. Please take a moment to complete it. And then also our next webinar is on the 31st regarding lost pet unification that fits so well. So all of you that are here, not only come back to our webinar, but also um, get all your lost pet people that are inside your shelter um, to, to come as well and, and pass it along, tell a friend, uh, because this is such an important piece of keeping animals out of the shelter. Um, and with that, I wanna thank all of you have a good night. Thank you for 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 staying over, and um, we will see you um, on the thirty first. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for inviting me. Yep. Stay safe. Have a great night. Thank you, folks. <laughs>